to tonight's carnival and festival event. My name is Gordon Williams and I am the master of ceremonies for what's going to follow. On your ticket, you will see it says Nostalgia 2016. I'm sure you'll agree 2016 has been a very interesting and very unusual year, especially in the sense that so many charismatic and stars of screen and radio and stage have passed away. People like Teddy Wogan, Paul Daniels, and of course, our good friend, Bob Rowley, who died in May, age 78. You also perhaps have spotted that there are sort of uh, signs about saying it's a tribute to Bob, and it's entitled, Nostalgia will never be the same again. Now you might think, well, how come they changed from the title of Nostalgia to what we have on, on the poster? Well, basically, it came about because when Bob died and, and so many people wanted to go to his funeral and so on, his funeral event, they were unable, unable to do so. Many people were on holiday and just couldn't perhaps make it. So Steve and Dave suggested perhaps we could have some sort of memorial service or some tribute event later on in the year, perhaps in September. But the more we thought about it, we felt time was running away, could we find a venue, could we find a time, we thought this is not going to work out. And right about that time, Graham, Graham Cook on my left, or Buster Productions, mentioned the idea that he wanted to put on a nostalgia evening tonight to highlight Bob's considerable contribution to the town and the charity fundraising events. So we got together and we said, why don't we combine the two ideas? So tonight, we hope you enjoy a fun evening of footage, memories, anecdotes. We want this to be an upbeat and entertaining, amusing, fun event. But there will be time for reflection and there will be time for sadness, I would suggest. Because Bob was very dear to our, to our hearts. He would not have wanted us to be miserable. You know Bob, and his spirit is, is going to be with us this evening, no doubt. Now, in keeping the tradition of Bob's nostalgic evenings, we're going to have two sections uh, of about 45 minutes an hour. And there'll be a song at the end. <laughs> yes. So clear your voices, clear your throats, and get into song, the song mode. And as Bob would have said, no nudity. <laughs> uh, as we try to load the clips and make things happen, still I was yes, well, but great. Um, some faces will pop up, and we will have some thoughts, some poems, some stories, some anecdotes, and so on. And with that in mind, we would like to start the second half, after we've had our, our drinky poos and so on, uh, with an open mic session. So you are cordially invited to, to say a few words, some memories, some stories, some reminiscences about our good friend Bob. Uh, if you'd like perhaps to see me in the break, and I'll write your name down, and when we come back after the break, I'll try to get the mic to you, see if you, you can have, have your tell your tale. It should be brilliant. At this moment, can I just mention someone who crept in like, towards the end uh, as, as we were coming together? And that person is Chris, Chris Harrison. I hope I'm not going to embarrass Chris, but I'm now going to say, if you recall, at Bob's last nostalgia evening, he mentioned his partner, Chris. And Chris was a tower of strength, all through, through Bob's, Bob's demise. As Bob's health was fading, Chris was there to support. And we owe a great debt. Thank you, Chris. Thank you also to the um, Macmillan Cancer Fund. Brilliant support. Hey, I'm getting emotional. Let, let me stop. I'm going to hand over to, to Graham, who will explain how the rest of the evening is going to go. Enjoy yourselves. Yeah, we promised you a microphone, you haven't got it. We promised you 
actually no nudity. You can forget that for a start. There is always nudity, so we'll start off as we mean to have it on. Postman Pat, and then Thomas the Tank Engine. Titanic, complete with an iceberg. The joys of cricket, 100 years of cinema, two nights on horseback, Treasure Island, complete with a rowing boat, Butch and the Sun Dance, the Tamworth 2, a walking war memorial, and a model of the Abbey, and two protest pieces, the Abbey Railing and the Death of the High Street. These and many more were the products of the most amazingly nimble, creative, funny, intelligent, and slightly naughty brain <laughs> of Bob Browning. That intelligence, softened so beautifully by his wonderful accent, observational skill, and sense of the absurd, also shone through in his Marsbury nostalgia events in recent years. For many, Bob was synonymous with Marsbury Carnival, the first name to rise from the lips when Carnival was mentioned. Tonight, the main task of the remaining bustards is to add his name to the pantheon of carnival greats. We start with a short film with photographs and film of Bob in action during carnival processions.
Right, that's, that's the next carnival, that's the next... Uh, Margie Nostalgia. Woo! Buster Productions are um, fantastic and they've done a great deal to uh, enliven this year's carnival. I hope they carry on and they go from strength to strength and we hopefully might have some more little Busters in the future. I think it's been a very successful procession, Graham. It's been good fun. Bob obviously wanted us to be a part of dolphins. We've dressed up suitably for, for the beach, and we've had great fun and collect a lot of money. And I think it's a good spirit about, about, about the carnival. Well done, everybody. The last word on carnival has to rest with Bob Browning. Bob, how was it? It was absolutely brilliant. It always was. My only regret is someone gave me a pint of beer in a glass, in a, sorry, in a bottle, and a policeman confiscated it. Confiscated it? They took it away, Graham. Bob, that's dreadful. Go this, go this way. Um, 
it's a trivial issue in a way, not allowing art on the Abbey railings, but Bob felt enough, and maybe he didn't have any other ideas for Carnival. Um, <laughs> so we had the idea that we'd do a Carnival float. Bob did 95% of the work. Um, we chipped in with a few ideas, as you saw. Um, he went round with a skateboard on his head, and I went round with an artist's palette, because the premise was that, okay, you don't mind people skateboarding inside the Abbey, but you don't want art on the outside. And we walked around, Gordon dressed up as an impressionist French painter, and we had a lot of fun. But at the bottom of it, Bob thought, you know, I want to make a point. And when we got to Oxford Street, I could see the vicar. It's <laughs> <laughs> not here tonight, is it? <laughs> Neil Archer and his wife were watching the procession. And there are two things about that flow that I think made it even more worthwhile than the fun we had. When we reached the vicar and his wife, he came over to the middle of the road and shook our hands. And in 2016, six years after that procession piece, there was an art exhibition on the railings again. So it was a small thing, but it got under Bob's skin, and uh, it was another sighting. Driftwood Master. Bob had been collecting driftwood from various beaches around the country and used it to create the most wonderful pictures and collages. He was a man who used to notice such things. The music at the end is by Delius. Bob thought it sounded a little like being on your own on windswept shore. And I can see what he means by that. He had an eye for such mysteries. This is the Driftwood Master. Hello, my name's Bob Browning. I'm the proud owner of a bus pass, a Jack Russell dog and a Cotswold cottage. I've been interested in craft work all my life. I've done airfix models, balsa wood models. For a long time I was making walking sticks. This is hazel and as you can probably appreciate grew this away up and the head was just originally a thicker branch. For a long time I was on the craft circuit I was also made Welsh love spoons. This again, as you can appreciate, is made from one solid piece of wood. The chain is made from a solid piece of wood. And the significance, the boy is saying to the girl that our hearts are joined and you have the key to mine. I love wood. This is a fairly boring piece of holly. Holly wood has virtually no visible grain, so it's remarkably ordinary. But when you cut through a branch, it will crack, you'll get that lovely pattern there and I've got that pattern is the decoration on this spoon. I've done very little to it, it's just a very ordinary spoon. Mother Nature has done the decorating. But the latest project is driftwood pitchers. I love them, they're fairly easy for me to make. I spend lots of time picking up driftwood. There's not too much driftwood here but I like the idea, just a couple of girls made of pine you can pick up the grain in the birds and the fact that the yellow wood is, is complemented by the yellow rope appeals greatly to me and just a piece of tongued and grooved which to me looks like wet sand. Again I've picked up the colour in this one, an oyster catcher and the blue rope obviously picks up the blue of the wood. I've done the same with orange rope which picks up the orange in his beak. Over on my right hand side we've got this wonderful, well, to me we're at a wonderful piece of wood exactly as I found it down at Portland. It's festooned with pieces of rope, pieces of seaweed and an awful lot of fishing net, uh, sorry fishing line. In fact if we look closely in there I can find six fishing hooks hidden away inside there. The fish are pine, this is just a piece of um, seaweed that I picked up at Portland. But my favourite I think is the one I call Screaming Girl over on the extreme right and it appeals hugely to my sense of humour the fact that this girl on the 
the right hand side is shouting, two are flying away and on the extreme left one is flying straight out of the picture. Gives me great pleasure in mating them. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the story about them. Benson, a man known for his, I quote, 
dashing personal style, and who was later described as the best dressed tabloid war reporter of his generation. I mean, he never come across anybody like our Bob Browning, mind you, as you will see. The second is an edition of Collector's Log, a Channel 4 weekday afternoon program presented by David Thrower. A program which incidentally, at its peak, reached over 2 million people per day. The video, sadly like so many, was in a very bad state. Um, this is about as good as it gets. But it's worth persevering with, I promise you. If only to catch Ross Benson say to Bob, it's time to come out of the closet. <laughs> and Bob telling Debbie Thrower that he probably was the tidiest boy of his generation. He really was just a natural. like Bob Browning, early 20th century wooden hangers have a fascination all of their own. It's the adventure and romance conjured up by the writing on the hangers that's got Bob hooked. More wooden hangers. One problem with wooden hangers, they do get woodworm. But here we've got even worse problems than woodworm. We've got beetles. As a man who appreciates a fine coat hanger myself, I'm eager to meet Bob, so I've arranged a rendezvous at my hotel. As it happens, I have an intriguing coat hanger of my own that I'd like to know more about. Two things wrong with this scene. First of all, you're the wrong sex, and secondly, you're fully dressed. So, what are you doing in my wardrobe? Mm, Ross, I collect coat hangers. How on anything? They're very boring, very modern, and there's no writing on them. But nothing is new, Ross. This is very modern, this is very old. It's only the same and you can't steal it. And there's no hooks? Indeed. One from Gamages, about 1920s. So what's this? Very intriguing, Ross. I've been looking for one of those for a long time. Do you know what it is? No idea. SPS, Salvationist Supplies and Printing. Salvation Army, Ross. So you must have known a Salvation Army lady at some time, Ross. Not that I recall, but you never know. You never know. I'd be very interested in that one. Of, would you like to swap it? Yes, presumably you've got some with you. Just a few, Ross. Would you like to see some? Well, absolutely. So come out the closet, Bob. Oh, dear. There's going to be no afternoon snooze for me. I wasn't quite expecting so many. What have you got? Probably a thousand now, I would think. And what's... what's this? That's one for you, Ross, obviously. Smart, small, sophisticated, executive, but complete with little tiny handkerchief in the breast pocket. It's got a whole lot, isn't it? Doesn't it just? No, it's got very little, though. Now, where is that <laughs> from? That was given to me at a WI meeting, actually. <laughs> I bet Rosemary Hawthorne doesn't have one like this in her collection. Dry cleaning ones are interesting. They all advertised how very efficient they were and how very quick. We've got inner day cleaners, no delay cleaners, speedy clean, 1935, 60 minute cleaners. Take them back and you get a hate back on your hangers. Ross. 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 This talk about hangers and I still don't know which one to swap for my Salvation Army one. What about this? It's got a brush like that inside it, but it has got R on it. Ross, <laughs> do you think that other hanger's mine? <laughs> I think the other hanger's certainly yours. That's great. They don't make them like that anymore, do they? They don't.
welcome back. If you've got teenagers, you're probably fighting a losing battle to get them to hang their clothes up. Perhaps if they met my next guest, they'd be more convinced of how useful a coat hanger can be. I bet you were a really tidy teenager, weren't probably you? Probably the tidiest, Debbie. I should think so, looking at this lot. Whatever got you actually collecting coat hangers? Though? I organised a hobbies exhibition or a collector's exhibition in Malmesbury in Wiltshire and decided that I could find something that didn't cost very much and hopefully no one else was actually doing so I hit on the idea of coat hangers with advertising on them. Now I reckon all of us have got one or two hotel coat hangers tucked away at the back of the wardrobe so. but you like to actually visualise where they come from. Yeah I've written to some of the hotels and some have written back this hotel princess in Bermuda sent me a couple of catalogues and they look absolutely wonderful but so you didn't pink. actually pinch that one. Oh, no, no. Here. Most of them have actually come from um, charity shops, good, good source of supply, and all my elderly relatives. Everyone my age has got one, as you say, so. But charity shops are a good bet. And do some of these individual hangers then set you off on a sort of detective trail? Yes, they do. This, the one Berengaria, I actually bought in Portsmouth in a second-hand shop. And Berengaria, when I looked at it, I made my own mind up but it was a ladies clothes shop for some unknown reason and then reading a book discovered that in fact it's a, a sailing ship or a, a cunarder laid down in germany in 1912 and we, when we won the war we won the ship brought it back used it as a troop carrier and cunard have actually told me all that history and i've got now got postcards of the ship and the silk handkerchief too from the same ship. So it is the kind of social history of these hangers that interests you too. I like that, yeah. Let's have a look at some of the ones that we got in the wardrobe here. Let's have a look at what this one might tell us about where it comes oh, from. Oh, like this, yeah. Where's it? Wilson's for Fashions, now and always, 1925, 1946. Now and always. And always, Debbie. Yeah. That was very confident, wasn't it? <laughs> wasn't it just a wonderful confidence? I, I'm a bit of a romantic and I don't think I'll be trying to trace them because the chances of them still being around is a little bit thin, I think, don't you think? You'd like to keep that a bit of a mystery. That's right, you? yeah. What else have we got up here? Expert cleaners. Oh, all the dry cleaners used to give you wooden coat hangers and they all advertised their efficiency with their names. So you get expert cleaners. There are lots more in oh, there. And they no all... delay cleaners. And we've got a rather useful looking one here. This looks Indeed. like it's got the clothes That's brush right. on the yeah, end as well. Fold up and become a clothes brush. This goes down, that goes along, and as you see, one yeah, clothes smart. brush. <laughs> now, you've got mainly wooden ones, but I spot a blow-up one Indeed. here. Where did yeah. this come from? Someone gave me that at the exhibition I've mentioned before, and they tell me that it's just a travelling coat hanger. As these are, of course, they break down that much smaller. There's a nice one over here that seems to have a little postcard along with it oh, as yeah. well. Butlins, butlins for holidays. Butlins for holidays. So I went to a postcard fair and found myself a Butlins postcard. The glass sides of Butlins indoor swimming pool, dated Bogner Regis, 1962, and it's they're saying, "Dear Aunt Andy, we're having a gorgeous time here. We've just come back to our chalet to go to bed, and it's 11:15." They were living, weren't they? 1960s, <laughs> the swinging 60s. We've just been to two theatres and have just seen Michael Holiday, and I'd like to get his autograph. Brilliant. So you keep those two together. <laughs> they just now. go together, yeah. Yeah. So do you know of any other coat hanger collectors? I don't. I dearly love to meet some. I do go to some, a couple of the charity shops that I go to. Someone's beating me to it, so I'm, <laughs> I'd like him to come out of the woodwork if he would. <laughs> and we can get together. I've got some swapsies. Well, let's hope we can put you in touch with some other okay. collectors. Thanks Thank very you. much indeed for joining Thank us. Thank you. And the first half of this uh, celebration concludes with an interview with Bob held on the 4th of May 2012. Steve Cox, sitting down the back there, another buster. Steve and I set out to record a series of interviews with people from around the town. In the end, we conducted 12 interviews, and these were edited into a DVD, which we entitled In Conversation With. Bob was the reluctant participant number 11 and had to be almost manhandled into one of the rooms in the town of Hall here. But once he was settled, he relaxed, and we get Bob. The interview actually lasts 16 minutes, but these are some of the highlights. Bob, in conversation. When did you first come to Malmesbury? 
I came here in 1970 when we'd just been just been married, my wife and myself. Yeah. Down to Cambridge Cottage. Very different town then in 1970. West Street was, I think there were four houses occupied. Bear in mind I came here as a postman. Just four houses occupied in West Street. The rest were pretty well derelict. The horse fair, half the horse fair was empty. Reed's farm was a farm. In fact, I can remember delivering mail to Alan Webb and he was actually hand milking cows on Reed's farm. Um, White Lone Park was just being built and when, when I came, there were just eight postmen in Malmesbury. I think there's about 24 now. What were your earliest memories of the high street? The earliest memories of the high street? Well, probably again, delivering mail to them and always being surprised to a, a, a postman that came here from Swindon, which is fairly conventionally built and fairly modern. Malmesbury was a nightmare because, of course, the High Street, Burning Vale, and lots of other little of the old streets have got houses tucked away behind them that, that you're just unaware of completely. Go down into somebody's garden and find there's two more houses there. It's brilliant. What were your favourite shops when you first came to Malmesbury? Shops, gosh. Well, I've always been fond of knees. Cadell's, of course, were. It operated in the butchers at the bottom of High Street, 58 High Street. And they used to deliver, brilliant, they used to deliver meat down to, you know, around the local villages, and in, which included us down at Cambridge. So that, that's probably high on my list. And then there was a, for a short period of time, there was a, a craft shop at number 27, which is now the, the bakehouse, that sold crafts. I can't remember the name of it, it didn't last very long, and for a little while I used to, but my love, I buy carved glass love spoons, as you know, and for a little while she used to sell those. So that's about it. So you used to sell your love in the high street? Sell so my love in the high street, yeah, love for selling yeah. If you had to choose a favourite spot in Malmesbury, where would it be and why? Favourite spot? But actually it would be just outside. But living where I do, down at Cambridge, I used to walk down to Iron Grove Woods a lot. And midway between the two is a place that a lot of local people will know, the Roaring Hatches. Uh, lots of people have talked, old, old people have talked to me and told me that they swum down by the Roaring Hatches, which you could do. There's an old drover's bridge there, or there was, it's actually fallen into disrepair now. But I used to sit down there a lot bird watching, and um, I've, I've watched kingfishers nesting down there. And then came back some days later, only to discover that either a fox or a badger had actually dug down, knowing where they were, and they were about a yard in from the bank. He dug a hole down and taken all the young ones out and ate them. And they were just fledging. You could just see some of the little stubby feathers where this bloody fox had, or badger, I'm not sure which. How would you like to see Malmesbury develop in the future? Well, how would I like to see it develop in? You know, I'll tell you what I wouldn't like to see it develop. <laughs> I wouldn't like to see two supermarkets. <laughs> Um, how would I like to see it? I, well, I, I, the old town, I, I just leave the old town alone. I, ex expansion, I guess, is inevitable. I wouldn't like to see it down my way. I've had expen expansion there with Red Row. Um, the best use of the site, certainly it is. Housing, housing is necessary, but there's such an awful lot of houses. There are too many, they're too high. They're built, I don't understand why Today they have to build houses higher than trees. I, you know, I don't understand that. It's, well, I, yes, I do understand it because you can get more tiny houses in. If you build them thin and build them high, you can get more houses in the acreage. I would like to see develop very little, really, for the long haul. What, what memories have you got of Malmesbury Carnival in the last past years? Things that stand out for you? Well, I, I don't know whether... Well, yeah, I do know. I, I, I do know that there are a few people that look for me in the pedestrian section, and I find that very flattering. But when I came here in '70, there was an old codger, <laughs> bit like me, <laughs> who I used to look for, and he was always in the pedestrian. I don't know what his name was. I've never seen a picture of him. I think if I saw a picture of him, I'd remember him. But I, I used to look for that old codger, and, I, and it's a sort of sobering experience to think that there are people out there now that might be looking for this old codger. But I do remember the guy that did YMCA with those wonderful four or five characters 
on canes and he, he just played, blared the music out. And my own efforts, um, I did a, a long boat, a canal boat with the tunnel house and the Daneway from the Cotswold Canals. And, and that, was, that was good. In fact, I, I, I've got I've no grandchildren, but I've got a little lad who I've sort of half adopted as a grandchild, a relative of mine, a second cousin twice removed or something. And I painted his name on the side of the longbow, Charles Winch, which has nothing to do with the Winches in Malmesbury, Charles Winch, Call Holier, Holier, Gloucester. And we did win the prize. And when the, the um, newspaper man came along and asked the little lad what his, what his name was, he didn't answer, he just pointed. Charles Winch, Colin Hall here in Gloucester, and just put his chest out. Yeah, good fun. Oh, and the, the, when I did a Viking thing, I did this wonderful sword, a metal sword that somebody made when I was a, a, a knight on horseback, but this time I was a Viking, I had a, a hard hat with horns, sacking, a hiking, a, 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 um, a sword, so I was a Viking, but I decided that I could make a, a, a long boat on a bicycle, a Viking longboat. And I started making it and I thought, well, they, they really are longboats, they don't want a bike, they want a tandem. So I got this tandem and converted that into a Viking longboat. And then I got a mate of mine, also dressed up the same. And instead of being, so I was a biking Viking, of course, in my tandem, I was a biking Viking. And my mate, I dressed up exactly the same because I had another set of horns and another hat and another sword and some more sacking. And I got him to wear a rucksack and go like that a lot. So he was hiking, biking, and then I got really <laughs> clever, as I thought. And I made, I made two cardboard, you'll have to think about this one, two cardboard shields with little straps on it, just fell onto your arms. You could wave your sword around. A green shield with a white tick on it. A white tick. Think tennis, think sponsors, think Nike. So we were Nike, hiking, and biking, Vikings. <laughs> you want to try saying that on the, on the Saturday evening? <laughs> when you want a, a couple of lemonades. Oh, one more, Stevie. Only last year or a year before that, uh, two years ago, I think it was, I, since I was banned drinking, I, I still outrageously try and scrounge booze off anybody who is drinking on, 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 on the streets, and I usually manage to get some. I got some given me near the, near the mirror. I got on by the burrows, raised my bottle to the lads hanging out the window, and they shouted, you can't drink on the street. And this bloody black and yellow armband came out, and this copper took my booze off me, and I nearly burst into tears. Oh. Sad. And did, did you, was it a few years ago you did the red barrows? Oh, the red barrows, yeah. Yeah, we did the red barrows. <laughs> Um, we just cardboard silhouette of wheelbarrows and we all carried them. I think we all wore goggles and flying helmets. I don't know where the helmets came from. And uh, attached to the handles of the barrows, we just had red, white and blue streamers. So if you went like that look a little bit quick, they'd stream out the back looking like the um, slipstream of the jets. Yeah, I love, I love carnival. It's great fun. <laughs> Can I just regain with the story, please, and to finish off, and my story is about how I first got involved with Bob and the carnival. And it came about, I seem to remember, many, many years ago, when Bob worked in the post office, and I had to go in to collect uh, delivery, which, which could be delivered. And on, on the wall, if you recall, he had some of the photos of what he was doing with the car previous carnivals. I said to Bob, Oh, I'd love to be in a carnival float. I've never done it, but he'd been in the, in the town 30 years or whatever. And Bob, being the kind sharp he is, said, come along. Next time we have a float, come along. Dress as Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> ah, nah, that's why we get Robinson Crusoe guy. Well, he didn't tell me that I wasn't going to be on the float. What he had done, Bob, in his inventive mind, was to take a kind of buffet on one casters and nail vinyl records around the side with a kind of tree coming out the middle. So we met in those days up Tetbury Hill. 
you recall. And we off we went, we set off, and I was to follow the float, dragging this bloody thing behind me, until we got to the mother core, and the wheels fell off. <laughs> but Bob again being Bob, you know, such a nice chap, he said, uh, no problem matey, in that lovely accent, climb on, and, and I've been cli I was climbing on, on the floats ever since. And I owe you all a great debt. Oh, by the way, by the way, it wasn't in vain. We got second prize. And there's the certificate. <laughs> Titled uh, The Bob Browning Carnival Times in Holy Arrival. 